So it's great to be here. Actually, uh, I had a great time. I'm not going to lie to you. I did not think I was going to last through today, being in a different city uh, every day, but it's been fun. I had a really, really good time, and uh, I, I enjoyed it tremendously. And it was awesome to see some of my old colleagues, like Dr. Child, uh, at some point in time. We were practically children working together as residents uh, at UC Davis, and it was great to see her and hear that she and Colin are doing really well. So let me tell you what I want to do. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about hematology. And this is the official title uh, I was provided with, and I thought maybe we, we will use this one, but I decided to use this one, all right? And that's uh, me, and that's uh, IDEX, all right? So, so the big issue is uh, I do clinical hematology. I'll tell you a little bit about what I do for a living in, in the States, and I learned to radically change the way I do hematology after using this instrument, the prosite that uh, Matt was talking to you about. And uh, what I want to do is show you how hematology has advanced in the last few years and what kind of things you have at your disposal to significantly improve the quality of care of your patients. That's my email address, you guys. Uh, it will be also in the last slide, so if you have any questions, I will be delighted to answer them. And, uh, if you have hematology or onco or whatever, uh, no charge for the time being, so you're, you're welcome to email me. So I'm not a clinical pathologist, all right? So I am an internist, and the reason I'm an internist is A, I really like internal medicine. B, uh, you cannot be a good oncologist unless you're a good internist, because oncology is internal medicine in a patient with a tumor. And C, when I finished my residency, there was no oncology specialty, so I had no other choice but uh, rather going back and doing more internal medicine. But I am, as I, as I said the other night, a closet clinical pathologist. I really like ClinPath, and uh, I was very, very close, uh, Davis, uh, starting a residency in clinical pathology, and then I, I said, well, you know what, maybe I can still be a clinician, do hematology, do ClinPath, and be you know, next to my patient and their family. I work with IDEX since, you know, I worked at Ohio State for 30 years. I retired two years ago. My retirement lasted almost exactly 10 days when I realized that uh, retirement is for old people. And you saw that stuff, I'm an old guy, but, but it was really boring. You know, this gardening and bird watching and all these things. Yes? Was your wife actually going to shoot you or something? Uh, well, it, there were a few attempts on my life, I'm not going to lie to you, but, uh, but it was uh, after some medication and counseling, things got significantly better. But the truth of the matter is that I, it was boring. So now uh, I, I have worked with IDEX, as Matt was telling you, since the old days of the laser side, and I'm now working with them, doing a number of different things. And, and I have used IDEX hematology equipment since the laser side came out, so I'm biased, right? So, and again, even when I lecture for groups that have nothing to do with IDEX, I have this exact same disclaimer because that's, that's what I use. So, I'm going to ask you three or four questions. So, the first one is, how many of you guys do in-house hematology? All right? Don't be shy. You can go like this. There's no problem. All right, great. So, most of you. And how many of you look at all the blood smears from the CBCs that come out of your instrument? Hello? Anybody home? Ah, uh, gotcha, all right? So, uh, so here's what happens, all right? So we do not get, we kind of love them, we hate them, we don't like the microscope. Uh, Remember, microscopes are a challenge. They're okay to look at fecals and skin scrapes, aren't they? Because they always have oil and they're dirty. You still don't know what the hell you're looking at, so, so they are really, really good. But when you have to do fine tuning, then it gets a little bit more complicated. And, you know, I mentioned what I was lecturing to the previous groups. I started lecturing on hematology in 1983. And at that time, the percent of people that looked at blood smears was exactly the same one that today, all right? So in 30 years, I had a major impact on veterinarians looking at blood smears. So I practically gave it up. And luckily enough, the prosite came into place. And the prosite has allowed me to look at less and less and less blood smears, because if you understand the graphics, they are quite predictable of what you will see in the blood film. And I'm going to show you that with cases. So the question that frequently comes up anywhere in the world is, should you do your CVCs in-house, or should you send them out to a reference lab? And the answer is, this is in Spanish, as you most recognize, that means yes. 
is yes to both, all right? So, so some of you may elect to do them in-house because you have an instrument that you trust. Some of you may think that it's a waste of time uh, because you will have to look at the smears and nobody's really interested in doing them. But to be honest, uh, when we started doing in-house hematology, this happened precisely three months after we got the prosite. So we had a busy oncology service at OSU. We would see about 100 patients a week, so we would do 15 to 25 CBCs a day. And when we send them to the lab downstairs, we have a lab downstairs that is literally a large reference lab, uh, it would take three to four hours for a CBC to come back, and that is unacceptable. You know Why was that? Because they had an impedance counter and they had to do manual differentials. So three months after getting the prosite, we quit sending samples to the lab, which did not really go well with the clinical pathologists because now in the Excel spreadsheet, their numbers didn't look all that good, but we were having CDC results very rapidly and reliably. So, so we, since I would tell you this was September or October of 2009, before the instrument became commercially available, all the CDCs that I've done are in-house CDCs with the ProSide. And I work in two different practices now, and one of the requirements is they must have a ProSide because I, I became dependent, probably addicted is a better word, to, to this instrument. So, so for me as an oncologist, uh, one of the beauties of doing in-house hematology is the speed. You know, I uh, put the sample in there, and remember, uh, we veterinarians are not very good at following instructions, you guys know that, so there's been plenty of studies where they look at how veterinarians compare performance-wise with technicians or nurses in performing diagnostic procedures, and the nurses are way better than we are. Because when it says five seconds, for us five seconds is one, two. Uh, when it says add three drops, we say, well, we can probably spare one drop for the next dose, so we would use two, and so on and so forth. So if you actually do things the way you're supposed to do them, these instruments are very, very trustworthy. And as a veterinary oncologists and internists and hematologists in academia, when we had the opportunity to use this instrument, uh, we put it through the paces just to see how good it really was, all right? And, and we were very, very happy with the results. So, I'm gonna ask you one other question, all right? So, typical day in your clinic, you run a CBC or a hematology, and you have a patient right there, you just took a good history, you did a physical, you have your you know, working diagnosis or your short uh, list of differential diagnoses, and now you're looking at the CBC, all right? So how many of you pay attention primarily to the numbers in the, in the report? Don't be shy now, all right? We, do you guys have analyzers that print out graphics? Anybody has, so a pro side, laser side, or impedance? How many of you guys look at the graphics? How many of you look at the graphics and understand what the graphics are? Some of you, that's good, that's good. And you already told me none of you look at the blood smears, so I'm not gonna ask you that. And uh, one of the things that I usually incorporate into the evaluation of the results is, if I think that the patient has disease A, I would expect certain changes associated with disease A. And if they are not there, it kind of sh shoots me in a different direction. And uh, to be honest, in the ideal world, we, we do all of them, all right? Now, the deal is as follows. Still, to this day, 2015, in veterinary schools, at least in the US, we do not talk to the students about in-house analyzers. We don't. It's called job security, because the guys that teach are clinical pathologists, and they probably want for them to have a job, and, uh, and I tell you, they will not see an, an in-house benchtop analyzer. So, what do we teach them? We teach them that if the white count is high, you worry. If it's higher, you worry more. If it's slow, you worry. If it's lower, you worry more, right? And, and the subliminal message, as I usually say, is that if the numbers are normal, if the total count is normal, you don't worry too much. And what I'm gonna do purposely, I picked, I think that three cases, that have absolutely normal numbers to show you how normal numbers can mean trouble, all right? If the patient is telling you trouble. So, so when I read a CBC, because they come properly lined up in terms of you know, red cell parameters, white cell parameters, and platelet parameters, that's the way I read them. So what I do is I look at the red cell parameters first, and I try to draw a conclusion from what the red cell parameters are telling me. Then I look at the white cell parameters, and the first thing I do is I get rid of the percentages. Because remember, percentages, at least to me, don't mean anything. The only time you use the percentages is if you're looking at a blood smear, 
uh, you're doing a differential, then those numbers should match. But a percent of a total number will give you a number, all right? And I do not believe in the terms relative lymphocytosis, relative neutrophilia. You either have it or you don't have it. So it's fairly simple. So, so I don't pay any attention to that. And then what I do is I look at the leukogram, I look at the thrombogram, they, then I integrate the four, and or the three. The fourth is the total protein, because I always run a, a refractometer total protein when I do a CDC. And then what I do is I try to integrate those four values with the patient, with, with the patient's telling me. And that is actually the, the most fun part of the equation. So if you looked at blood smears, you, you actually would do it, mainly because it's your quality control, all right? Uh, we implicitly trust the analyzers, and we think that the analyzers always work well, even though we don't calibrate them, we don't do quality control, and, and we think, well, I bought this analyzer five years ago, so I'm sure it's still working really, really well, but you never really put it to the test. You, you know, if you run microhematocrits and you look at blood smears to see what the white counts are, that will really, really help you. And, you know, I was telling the story yesterday, so I, I got a consult about three weeks ago, this is a 13-year-old male castrated cat that is just not feeling well, nothing specific. So on physical exam, the cat doesn't have any obvious abnormalities and they do a CBC using a laser sight. So the veterinarian who was a former student of mine sends me an email because she goes, I am so excited I have a cat with essential thrombocytemia. This cat had a 1.7 million Platelet count, and the cat was marginally and marginally anemic. Had a PCB of a hematocrit of 25, give or take. Uh, normal sitting with the indices, the MCB on the kind of low end. Long story short, uh, she was very excited, and because we had published a paper on essential thrombocytemia in a cat, she wanted more information. So she sent me the graphics, and the long and the short of it is that they had an issue with calibration of the instrument, and the instrument was counting red cells as platelets. All right. So that 1.7 million platelet count was probably 300,000 platelets and 1.4 million red cells. And because it was counting less red cells, the hematocrit was lower. In other words, a normal cat, all right? So they basically took to service, they fixed it, and everything is fine. So, so the, the case report that she was so excited about writing up ended up not materializing, all right? So if we look at the blood films, you know, one of the biggest uses, at least in my uh, mind, is to look at red cell morphology. And we do really well with a lot of morphologic red cell changes when I look at the graphics, but uh, from my perspective, the graphics in the instrument are much better for leukocyte changes. So I can practically predict with high accuracy any of these abnormalities from looking at the graphics. So I can tell you if you have a left shift or toxic changes or if we see abnormal cells. And I'm gonna show you uh, examples quite, quite quickly here. So this is a case, you know, yesterday I was saying, I had zero involvement in the management of the patient. This dog just happened to be housed in the cage above one of my patients. So I just happened to look at the CDC while I was caring for a greyhound that was in the cage underneath, and, and I found it kind of interesting. So it's a four-year-old uh, male castrated Jack Russell, severely hypoglycemic. So hypoglycemic that basically the glucose is not detectable. He's been in status epilepticus for about six hours. Uh, the dog is now on has an IV catheter. He's getting a bolus of glucose. He's on a, on a five percent dextrose drip. Uh, no predisposing factors, according to the owner. You know, we're going through our head. What differentials do we have for a four-year-old indoor male castrated Jack Russell with hypoglycemia? Probably not an insulinoma because it's a four-year-old dog. It's not a hunting dog. The dog was healthy until he started seizuring, and the owner is totally freaked out about this dog. She's crying, she's upset, and as I was saying last night, on the third uh, visit to the exam room when the student goes to talk to the owner, the owner all of a sudden opens her eyes like this and looks at the student. She goes, do you think that this could be from the insulin I gave him? So what do you guys think? Could it be from insulin? Sure. Insulin is supposed to lower blood glucose, correct? As Wikipedia will eloquently say. So. So everybody said, oh, that's it, fabulous, whatever. The dog was a recently diagnosed diabetic, and the owner decided that he didn't look all that good, increased the, the insulin dose, and the dog is severely hypoglycemic. So that was nice. I didn't know there was live music associated with it. So, all right, we'll, we'll see about it. There may be dancing with that. I'll tell you about it. You notice that I have like a Madonna thing, microphone, so we'll tell you about it.
I'll go to the local room and change in the halftime, and we'll do a little dance. So, so the deal is, everybody said, okay, so it's the hypoglycemia from the insulin, and what happened is, the glucose never went up, all right? So, so the dog remained hypoglycemic for hours, he's on a glucose drip, he's getting IV doses of uh, glucose boluses, and, and here's what catches my eye. So I'm looking at the CVC, this is out of an impedance counter, uh, SL9 3500 with a manual differential, all right? So he has a hematocrit of 52, so I'm fine because, you know, he's been seizuring, catecholamine release, splenic contraction, increase in the red cell mass. So he has a total white count of 8.1, that is normal for the reference instrument, and, and I'm already going, hmm, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? And it becomes even more interesting because he has a neutrophil count of 2.6 and a lymphocyte count of 5.3. All right, so, so the question that I ask myself is why a dog that has been seizuring for the last six hours doesn't have a stress leukogram, all right? So he should have a stress leukogram, not negotiable. This dog should have a stress leukogram, and, and for starters, you guys remember, the most consistent change in the stress leukogram is lymphopenia, okay? So he has a, if you use the old terms, he would have relative lymphocytosis and relative neutropenia. They are both normal, right? They're on the upper limit and the lower limit, respectively. And if you think about it, you go, well, which one of those would I pick? What would you guys pick? One, two, three, or four? I'll tell you, I'll, I'll help you out. Cuatro. <laughs> All right, so, so you go, okay, so he's hypoglycemic and does not have a stress leukogram, so he likely has Addison's, all right? And sure enough, the resting cortisol was less than 0.1, so they probably did not do, need to do a, a post, but they diagnosed hypoadrenocorticism, they gave him the first dose of dexamethasone IV, and within about five minutes, the glucose started going back up. So, so the, the take home point from this is basically, he did not have anticipated changes consistent with the disease. So, and, and again, this is a basically hypocortisolism uh, as opposed to mineral corticoid issues. So one of the beauties for us clinicians that is very different from the clinical pathologists is that we have the patient right there. So we took a history, we did a physical, hopefully, if we are uh, thorough veterinarians. Remember that there is a relatively new generation of veterinarians coming out of some training programs where the name of the game is how many tests can you run before you actually touch the dog, all right? And, and the game is, you have to stay above $1,500, if at all possible, uh, and then you go, oh, maybe I'll do a physical, and oh, here's the mass, all right? So, so the deal is, uh, we don't, don't do that at home. We are professionals, all right? But our patients keep us honest. So, so if the patients say one thing, and the ologist, another one, always listen to the dog. Dogs usually don't like So. So with two slides, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how hematology analyzers work, and there, then I'm going to show you a couple of cases as we go along. But impedance counters are the little guys that give you a three-part differential or a four-part differential, and they are, uh, you know, HM5, there is uh, Minray, there is a lot of different brands. And what they do is there is a, an electrolyte solution, the cells float in there, this area here is magnified to your right, and there are a negative and a positive electrode, and as the cells go through, they generate an electrical current. So the bigger the cell, the higher the current. So, so basically that current or resistance is proportional to the volume of the cell. So they are really good machines that were designed for industrial use, uh, to count particles in oil and things like that. And what they do is they're basically kind of like, uh, like this little dude, right? So here's a red bead, here's a green bead, and so on and so forth. So they do a fairly decent job, they're quick, they're inexpensive, they're easy to maintain, but as you will see, the, the technology is nothing compared to what a flow cytometer will do for you. So when Dr. Child and I were residents, my project was to work on flow cytometry. So I was working with a flow cytometer in the central campus at UC Davis that literally went from here to the end of the screen, all right? So it was that big. And you have to tweak it every morning, hit it with a hammer, kind of use the wrench and whatnot. It will work for about an hour, and that was it. Then you have to let it relax and come back the next day and use it. And if somebody would have told me at that point in time that I would have a flow cytometer sitting in a little box like this in my office, I would say, I don't think so, Chuck, all right? So, no way. But what a flow cytometer is, remember you have one or more lasers that are uh, aiming uh, the beam to these little cells or at those little cells that are going in 
from top to bottom or bottom to top, depending upon the instrument. And as the laser beam is on and the cells go through it, they interfere with the beam of light. And remember that the cells are spherical and they have organelles and they have nuclei, so some of that light will make it right through, other light will bounce off, all right? And it will bounce to the right, to the left, to the front, to the back, and when they do that, the sensors will capture all that information and they generate a fingerprint for each individual cell type. For the red cell, the reticulocyte, the platelet, and the five types of leukocytes. So that's the way these instruments work. So you guys remember a red cell is a biconcave disc, all right? So it's a plate. So if you have the laser like this, you don't know if the red cell is going to go through like this, or like this, or like this, all right? So what the instrument does is it incubates them with a slightly hypotonic solution to sphere the red cells. So the red cells are now all chunky and they all go through in line, all right? And that's how uh, they capture all this information. So remember, it does this very, very rapidly. All these analyzers will do a red cell run first, then they lyse the red cells, and then they do a white cell run. So, I started doing hematology here, all right? So uh, a lot of the young guys have never seen a hemocytometer because they've not been to museums. So, so these hemocytometers, we used to use them all the time. They were a pain in a certain part of your anatomy because you never remember if you were counting the big squares or the little squares. And some would always come in and ask you a question when you're counting, you had to start all over again. And then I tell you when the QVC machine or the auto read, uh, at that time it wasn't even an IDEX instrument, uh, came into play. I started using that in 83 at Ohio State and it was fascinating because it's you know You put a little blood in a tube. It has a float. It has a dye and then it separates all these different layers And those layers actually tell you how many white cells you have What's the hematocrit? What's the platelet mass? And primarily if you have reticulocytes or not and this instrument is really good you guys and to be honest uh, if you ask me it's still the best instrument to look at platelets in Cavaliers King Charles, because remember, the Cavaliers have platelets that are the size of a three-year-old boy, all right? They have six platelets, but they're about this big. So, so this thing looks at platelet mass, and that's a nice packed platelet crit, and it's a really good way to look at, at functional platelet mass in the Cavaliers. So then, you know, in the early 90s, we started using the in-house impedance counters, and, and again, you know, Quick instruments, inexpensive, you know, in those days you could buy one of these things for three or four thousand dollars and, and they were very, very helpful, but we really needed to look at a lot of blood smears. And a lot of you know this, but some of you do not. When the QVC analyzers came into play and the impedance counters came into the market, they were designed for screening. So they were designed to determine whether the patient had normal or abnormal results, right? They were not designed to tell you if it's abnormal, here's what's wrong with your patient. They were basically, is it normal or is it not? And that's one of the things that we never learned in veterinary school, but that's how it is. And the impedance counters are really, really good at counting things, all right? If things get stuck together, like playlists in a cat, they don't really work all that well. So Dr. Metzger, who some of you may have met, Fred and I work together, I work in their practice, uh, I like a statement he makes all the time. He says, impedance counters are great analyzers for clinics that see only healthy dogs, all right? So if you see only healthy dogs, it's a great analyzer, but you will not need to look at a single blood smear. But anytime you have abnormalities, you must verify it with a blood smear. I'm gonna show you two cases, run with the impedance counter, and then I'm gonna show you a prosite, and I'm gonna show you a blood smear for you to see how this will bite you in the gluteus maximus if you're not looking at the blood smear. Flow cytometry came into play with the laser side, and then you know the pro side uses various methods, impedance, it uses flow impedance and flow cytometry and fluorescence, and all these instruments uh, produce some sort of graphics, as we mentioned before. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the graphics from the uh, pro side. So this is a pro side, and this is a report. Okay, a any of you guys uses a pro side? All right, great. So. So when you get a path report, or when you get a histopath report, or a cytology report, or, or a uh, hematology report, you tend to read and pay more attention to the things that are at the top of the report. And you tend to pay less attention to the things that are in the bottom. As it happens, the graphics are in the bottom. So it's an indirect way of telling me, uh, don't worry too much about the graphics. So I would really like for the the dot plots to come out like this, because to be honest, I do not look, and I, I, I hope that this is clear, I don't look at the numbers until I look at the graphics, all right? Period. 
That's the way it is. So I look at the graphics first, and then I get a better idea from looking at the numbers. And I'm going to tell you in two slides with how these graphics are generated. They are easy to understand. There should be very low mortality through the, the two slides. Most of you should remain alive and well. And it's important, again, if you have a hematology analyzer, to know what their limitations are, isn't it? Because if not, you will be missing things. And I'm going to show you some things that I'm sure a lot of you will look at and you will go, man, I used to miss this stuff because I missed it all the time, all right? So here's what happens. So if you look at the red cell and platelet dot plots from ProSide, uh, what you're looking at in the vertical axis is size, okay? So there's about 34,000 to 40,000 dots in here, so they're all compressed in, all right? And that happens to be the largest red blood cell. That happens to be the smallest red blood cell in this particular dot. If you were to measure from the top to the bottom and you find the midpoint, that's the MCV, that would be the mean cell volume, all right? So you immediately think about two things quite quickly, all right? If I have a dog with iron deficiency anemia that would be microcytic and hypochromic, this cloud would be a lot lower, all right? And I'm gonna show you one. So you just look at it, you go, bingo, iron deficiency. Or a shunt, okay? So they have a protosystemic shunt and they have a normal chematocrit. Or they are an Akita or a Sharpei or a Shiba Inu or one of those things. So, so what we're looking at on the horizontal axis is fluorescence. So the, there is a fluorescent dye in the reagents and remember, Red cells do not have any RNA in the cytoplasm, but reticulocytes do. Remember, the reticulocytes have RNA, and that is why they're called reticulocytes, because with a new methyl in blue, they stain blue. So fluorescence means what's on the right glows a lot, what's on the left doesn't glow a lot, all right? So each one of those dots is a reticulocyte. And remember, the retics come out of the bone marrow with a lot of RNA, and then they lose it as they circulate and spend a couple of days in the spleen. So the guys on the right are the young retics, and the guys on the left are the old retics. So when you have an early regenerative response, you tend to see more on the right than on the left. So, and the platelets, remember, they are tiny, all right? So that's why they are at the bottom of that vertical axis, but they have those little blue granules that are RNA, so they stream up and to the right. And remember, if this is a cat, there will be platelet clumps all the way up to here. So remember, Playlist in the cat. If you look at a cat funny, the playlist clump, all right? You don't even need to draw the blood. You go, ooh, and the playlists are clumped. Right? You see, I scare you. You see? I, you have to be paying attention. So, so the deal is, uh, you will see, uh, you know, yesterday we were uh, visiting a clinic and they, they showed me some dog plus in a cat and they were actually in playlist clumps all the way up to here, up to the upper right quadrant. So, so very, very common for you to see that. So, it's important for me to know whether an anemia is regenerative or not because I will work up these patients very, very different, all right? So the, the questions that I ask, the diagnostic tests that I'm gonna run in a patient with regenerative anemia are totally different than in a dog with non-regenerative anemia and totally different from a patient that has iron deficiency. So, so if you were to make an algorithm for anemia, the first thing I want to know as a clinician is in which one of these three cubby holes do I put it, all right? And I can look at that graphic, you guys, and I'm gonna show you, you're gonna do it for me, and you're gonna say, is this one, is the other one, or is the third one, all right? So it's very, very, very easy to do. And again, remember, uh, regenerative anemias can be due only to one of two things. The patient either bled or hemolyzed. Nothing else on this planet that will give you regenerative anemia. And I want for you to pay attention to these little descriptive terms here, because remember, they still teach us in veterinary school that regenerative anemias are usually macrocytic and hypochromic, correct? Because the reticulocytes are bigger, so the MCV is higher, and because they do not have enough hemoglobin, so that's why they are hypochromic. So they still teach this, you will still read it in the textbooks, and you will still hear it in every conference that you go to where we talk about anemia, and I'm gonna show you how that is actually not true, all right? I, I'm gonna pop your balloon. That does not happen like that, all right? So you guys are uh, almost experts in dot plots by now because you have seen one slide on how you generate dot plots. So I'm gonna show you these two dogs that have a hematocrit of 20 and a hematocrit of 19, okay? And I want to ask you, could you tell me if one of them has a regenerative anemia and the other one has a non-regenerative anemia? Is it 
Is it easy or is it complicated? What do you think? How many of you guys did like Rain Man and you counted all those dots? 6,333. All right, anybody counted dots? No. You looked at this and you went, I don't know what expression you use in, in Australia, holy mother of God or something like that. Look at all those purple dots, all right? So, so usually in the clinic, this is how they come to you. They either have a lot of purple dots or they don't have purple dots, all right? Simple, okay? There are very, very few that will be in the middle. Now, remember, this is important because everybody teaches you a different way to figure out if an anemia is regenerative or not. And for some of them, you probably need an iPhone app, all right? Because you will need to compute all this information the corrected reticulocyte index or the reticulocyte maturation index, and, and nobody agrees, all right? You show it to the next guy and they go, no, 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 you gotta look at the percentages. But nobody will argue with you that Josie has IHA, all right, or at least a stronger regenerative anemia, and nobody will argue with you that Exley has a non-regenerative anemia. It's a chronic kidney disease, though. It's a young dobie with bilateral renal hypoplasia, not very common, but uh, that's what Exley had. All right. So I'm going to show you this other dog plug, all right? So Captain Jack is a one-year-old male intact greyhound that was hit by a car, has been abandoned, uh, somebody found it by a road with a fractured uh, total thoracic uh, vertebra. And I'm showing you his red cell dog plug next to a normal dog, all right? And here's what I'm going to point out to you, okay? That's where the MCV is for a normal dog. So I ask you, are his red cells bigger or smaller? Don't be shy now. Smaller, right? You see how they all live in the, you know, underground or in the basement? You also see a lot of reticulocytes, and this is a greyhound, so you see too many platelets, all right? So he has microcytic anemia with reticulocytes and thrombocytosis. He has iron deficiency anemia, all right? So this guy has uh, hookworms that have first name, last name, and social security number, all right? So, so he's loaded with hookworms, and we treated him, and I have beautiful sequential dot plots after we treated the hookworm. So, so you just looked at the only three patterns you need to know for red cell morphology, all right? So this is really simple. I mean, not, not very complicated. You can teach an eight-year-old kid to read red cell dot plots. So they are very consistent, okay? Now, for white cells, uh, as I was saying before, and we've done this, right? We, we just did a lab in Barcelona in October, and I did it with a clinical pathologist, a very good friend of mine, who does not believe in graphics, all right? So we had 40 veterinarians, they all brought their own blood samples from their clinic, and actually we got some samples from the IDH reference lab uh, that morning, and we had two projectors, one that was connected to the ProSide, IBLS, and the other one that was connected to the projection scope. And what we did is the first six cases, I said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We project the dog plots, and I will tell you what you will find in the blood smear. And after the fourth dog, he goes, who told you what these dogs have? And I go, nobody told you what these dogs have. This is what you're going to see in the blood smear. So that's how they are uh, predictability-wise. So when you look at white cell morphology, or when you look at white cell characterization by the prosite, now the vertical axis is fluorescence, right? So, so remember, one important thing, white cells have nuclei, all right? So in addition to the RNA that you will find in the cytoplasm, you will find the DNA that is in the nucleus. So the bigger the nucleus, or the bluer the cytoplasm, the higher up those cells are going to be. Does that make sense, you guys? So if they are really huge nuclei with really blue cytoplasm, you will look for them up there. And that is where I look for neoplastic cells, all right? And remember, I'm gonna show you this, when we do a hand differential count, we count 100 leukocytes. The instrument is going to count about 16 to 18,000. All right. So if the instruments work well, what do you think? Are they going to be better than I am at the scope? Way better than I am. All right. It's way better than uh, I am. And I'm going to show you a couple of cases to illustrate that. So this is fluorescence. So it tells you how much DNA and RNA there is in the cell. Okay. And what we have on the horizontal axis is complexity or granularity or structure of the cytosol, if you may, and think about this. So if I shine this laser pointer through a glass of still water, a certain amount of light will make it through. If I now shine it through a glass of sparkling water, less light will make it through because it bounces off the bubbles, correct? So having said that, I'm going to ask you a question. So this is granularity, right? 
So that's a neutrophil, and I'm going to ask you this. If you look at a blood smear, and you look at a neutrophil, and an eosinophil in the dog, all right? Which of those two has more stuff in the cytoplasm? Which one has bigger granules? Eosinophils, all right? So therefore, they live to the right, okay? So because this is actually scatter of light, if you may, because of the number of organelles, they live to the right. Now, when this instrument came about, you know, everybody wanted a five-part par differential. They wanted basophils. Don't ask me why people want basophils, because I do not really care about basophils, right? I live in Ohio, and in Ohio we don't see a lot of heartworm disease, and in our clinics, typically if a dog has basophilia, they also have eosinophilia. So the basophils are nice to have there, but I don't really use them very often. Lymphocytes, remember, if you look at the mass of the cell, because most of the cell is nucleus, remember they have a very narrow rim of cytoplasm, they will glow a lot more than a neutrophil, all right? So they live on the floor above the neutrophils. And the monocytes, they have a big nucleus that has a lot of, of DNA, and remember, the cytoplasm is light blue, and it's light blue because it has RNA. So. So this axis then, as I was telling you before, is a composite between the DNA in the nucleus and the RNA in the cytoplasm, all right? So remember, we did a red cell run first, now we're doing a white cell run, and there's some little chunkies of red cells left behind. So in orange, you see those little pieces of red cells that are not completely lying. So this is a normal uh, leukogram or leukocyte dot plot. I'm gonna show you this one next to the abnormal ones, and now I'm gonna show you some cases. And you guys survived all the technical slides, so I'm very proud of you. Okay, so Toby is a 12-year-old. I'm gonna show you two cases that have very, very similar presentation, and I'm gonna show you similarities and differences, and I'm gonna show them to you with three different instruments. So, uh, not feeling well, uh, no previous uh, history that is pertinent to the current problem, and he's uh, depressed, anorectic for the last day and a half to two days, according to the owner. He's pale, he has very, very mild pyrexia, almost clinically irrelevant, and on palpation he has diffuse splenomegaly. Not a splenic mass, but a diffusely enlarged spleen. So acute onset of depression, anorexia, pallor, and diffuse splenomegaly. So when I am looking at a patient, you guys, to me, generating a very long list of differential diagnoses is worthless, doesn't help me at all. I need to generate a list of five or six important differential diagnoses, and I need to be able to rank them, because if I rank them, then my number one should be my definitive diagnosis, so if I did a really good job. Uh, so acute onset of anemia, all right, remember, there are only two things that will give you acute onset of anemia, blood loss and hemolysis, all right? If a dog bled, what should happen with the spleen? If this dog bled, the spleen should squeeze out, all right? So when I see a dog with acute onset of anemia and they have a palpably enlarged spleen, I fairly gently cross off blood loss from my list, all right? Now, remember, in cats, different story, because a cat will come to you with this exact same clinical signs, two-day history of depression, pattern, and anorexia, and they have chronic anemia, right? Because the cats are really good at shifting that oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve to the right. So, you know, every morning they wake up and they go, well, hematocrit of 18, I can handle it. I'm gonna crank this a little bit to the right, and the next day is 16, and they crank it a little bit, and now it's 11, and they go, ooh, ooh, now we don't feel really good, all right? So, so they come to you with acute signs, but they have chronic anemia, and that's very, very different between dogs and cats. So, so as it happens, in this practice, they have an HM5, that is an impedance counter, and they are test driving a prosite. So I'm gonna show you the results of both instruments for you to compare. And again, so that you know your limitations, all right? So if you have an impedance counter, uh, I don't think you want to go back tonight and have some sort of a ceremony and destroy it in public, but you will have to look at, at more spheres because if not, you're going to be in trouble. Okay, so let me ask you this. So Toby, Toby's pale, is he anemic? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Uh, and it, would you say that the anemia is mild, moderate, or severe? Severe, right? So, so that helps, isn't it? Because remember, there are only two mechanisms of anemia that consistently will give you hematocrits under 15 in the dog. Hemolysis and bone marrow disease, right? Those are the two big ones, okay? So because we said he's acutely ill, it's probably not bone marrow disease, because remember, the red cells circulate for, now we always say four months, now we know it's more like two and a half months, but, but they hang out for a long, long time. Okay, so he has severe anemia, all right? 
Uh, is his MCV normal? Yes, all right, so he has severe macrocytic anemia so far, uh, excuse me, normocytic anemia so far, all right? And he has a high MCHC, all right? So he has normocytic hyperchromic anemia. So remember, you the only way you can have hyperchromatia is if you have lipemia, all right? So this could be a postprandial sample and the fat interferes with a reading of the hemoglobin. Or if you have free hemoglobin floating in between the red cells, okay? So when the instrument measures the total hemoglobin, is measuring the hemoglobin that is within the red cells and the one that is in that pink plasma bathing the red cells. In other words, hemolysis, all right? However, the anemia is normocytic. And how many of you guys remember what the RDW is? Red cell distribution width, all right? And remember, what does the RDW mean? Notice that in Toby is normal. I'm gonna tell you what the RDW actually means. So if you look at that histogram, uh, I'll go back here, those are the platelets, all right? This actually, in the horizontal axis, uh, you have volume in femtoliters, all right? So those are the platelets and those are the red cells, okay? So the red cells are uh, distributed in a basically bell-shaped curve, and we call this red cell histogram. And this is a red cell histogram from a book. And what the RDW means is how wide is that bell curve. In other words, how much anisocytosis do you have? Do you have cells of different sizes, all right? And historically, you guys, the RDW was designed to rapidly screen human samples for iron deficiency anemia because it's very consistently uh, increased in iron deficiency. So, so I'm going to show you uh, what happens. Remember, the criteria for diagnosing regenerative anemias using indices is they should be macrocytic and hypochromic, and they should have a high RDW. So you have high RDW in regenerative responses and in iron deficiency. Why? Let me tell you what happens. If you have a lot of reticulocytes, okay, the reticulocytes are bigger than the red cells, so they widen that curve or that hump to your right, okay? So this number gets bigger. And if you have iron deficiency, they do it in the exact opposite direction. So now that number is a lot higher. So, so when I use an impedance counter, I pay a lot of attention to the RDW. And in the United States, when you ask veterinarians, do you look at the RDW? They ask, the RD what? All right? So it's there for a reason. So look at it, okay? And, and that will help you quite a bit. So this guy has normocytic anemia, okay? And he has a normal RDW. So, would you guys classify it as regenerative based on the indices or as non-regenerative? You will classify it as non-regenerative because it's, it's normocytic and the RDW is normal, all right? So, so if it is non-regenerative, then you're going to exclude chronic disease, you know, infection, cancer, chronic immune disease or something like that, and you're going to exclude chronic kidney disease, and then if you excluded those two successfully, you now must look at the bone marrow. So you need to do a bone marrow aspirate or a bone marrow biopsy. Totally different than you will do in these other patients, all right? Okay, so now with uh, all due respect, I'm going to pop your balloon, all right? So, so we said it's non-regenerative. So now let me show you this. I'm gonna show you the pro-site results. When you look at that, I'm going to get some rehydration. Do you guys like hot drinking water? Then don't leave it next to the projector. <laughs> don't recommend you do that. That's all right. All right, so let me ask you this. So look at the MCV is 81.8, upper limit of normal is 73.5, and the MCHC is kind of like almost at the lower limit of normal. But what catches your eye here? Lots of reticulous eyes, all right? So if you look at the results from the pro side, okay, would you classify it as regenerative or as non-regenerative? As regenerative, it's, it's pretty simple, all right? So he told you, I must have regenerative anemia because I'm acutely ill and I have a big spleen, all right? So I likely have uh, uh, hemolytic anemia. And again, this just changed the way you're gonna work them up. And it really changes the approach, changes what you discuss with the owners and what not. So let me tell you this, we keep preaching that regenerative anemias are macrocytic and hypochromic. And the truth is they are macrocytic and hypochromic 
eight to 11% of the time, all right? There is a really good paper from UC Davis, looking at that, from Mary Christopher's group, and out of 1,436 dogs, sort of 1,437 dogs, with generative anemia, 11.2% had macrocytic and hypochromic indices. So, so you will miss only 90% of them, all right? And what does this mean? If you have an impedance counter and you have an anemic dog, you must look at the smear. Polychromatia is way better than indices when you have an impedance counter. So luckily enough, if you have an instrument that counts reticulous eyes, uh, it makes a big difference because you immediately can identify that as a regenerative anemia, right? And no question that those are retakes, okay? There are retakes all over the place. So, okay. When you have 300,000 reticulous eyes, even if we didn't have a history for Toby, you, fer you fairly comfortably will exclude blood loss anemia because remember, it's extremely unlikely that you will get 300,000 retics from blood loss. You may get 100, 120,000, 150,000. So, so Toby is telling us, I think I have hemolysis, right? You, you guys already suspected that when he came in. Okay, so here's a question for you. What do you guys want to do next, all right? Do you want to repeat the CVC because you don't believe the machine? No, please don't. Do you want to send the sample to a reference lab for them to do a CVC? No, because they're gonna use the same machine that you have there. It's called a Sysmex, or it costs $150,000, but it's the exact same thing that you have on your, on your pro site, okay? Uh, do you wanna do a Coombs test, or do you wanna look at a blood smear? Let's think about uh, expense and promptness of the information. And I understand that by religion, you do not use the microscope, I understand that. But if you were, to be inclined to potentially use that optical device. Would you be looking at that smear? See? All right, good. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you, this is a video of the blood smear on Toby, all right? That's a nucleated red cell. That's a busted probably monocyte. Polychromatophilic red cells, all right? That have more uh, of a target cell appearance. What do you think about those little red cells that do not have central power? Look at that platelet, it's huge. It's almost the size of that cell. Remind me, what do we call those red cells that don't have central power and they're kind of spherical? Hey, you see, you're paying attention. They're a spherocyte. All right, good, very good, very good. Okay, so, so we're seeing regenerative anemia with spherocytes, correct? All right, so Polychromasia, there's a red cell fragment, some giant platelets. So this guy, uh, I'm not gonna show you all the values of the leukogram and thermogram, but he has 165,000 platelets. And he has big platelets, which probably means that he has increased platelet turnover. So he may be destroying some of the platelets. Here's the monocyte, and you know, again, you will see some nice spherocytes with polychromasia. Uh, you have a left shifted, so that's a band uh, with toxic changes and two donor bodies, and there you have a toxic neutrophil with dolar body. So, so basically you have an inflammatory leukogram, you have strongly regenerative anemia with spherocytes, okay? So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look closer to the body of the slide, where it's a little bit thicker, because we're looking for this. What do you think those are? Those chunks of red cells. Agglutination, all right? So we're, so we're looking for agglutination, and yeah, those are probably coin stacks or rouleau formation, but but we run through a few where they are probably more than 30, depending upon who's looking at them, they will say more than 30 or more than 50 red cells. So, so we see a few of those, okay? And you have them in here. So what we're gonna do now is do an in the clinic saline agglutination test or dispersion test. And Dr. Di Nicola actually gave me these videos, he showed them, and what he does is he puts anticoagulated blood, remember you take it out of the EDTA tube, and he puts a cover slip on top of the blood, and then he shoots saline with a pipette through the side, all right? So you use one of those droppers, and, and if there is autoagglutination, the clumps will persist, whereas if there is rouleau formation, they will break up. And as you can see, the, the clumps do persist, all right? So we have, I'm gonna ask you a question. This is for the grand prize, okay? So you have a dog with acute onset of clinical signs associated with anemia. He has splenomegaly, the anemia is regenerative. He has ferrocytes and autoagglutination. What do you think he has? Immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, right? So if you think about it, what is the probability that this dog would have something else infinitesimal? I mean, he could have something else. If he were a pit bull, this could be Babisha Gibson IO, right? But he's not a pit bull. So, so probabilistically, he has IHA. 
And do you want to do any other tests? No, because remember, autoagglutination is Mother Nature's Coombs test, right? So, so you don't need to do a Coombs test. So remember, if this were a golden retriever that actually had uh, this hemophagocytic uh, malignant histiocytosis, the hemogram will look exactly the same, minus the autoagglutination. You know, they don't autoagglutinate. They have spherocytes, but they do not autoagglutinate. All right. So what happened, final diagnosis was IHA, responded well to treatment with prednisone and azathioprine, and I think the take-home points were 90% uh, of the regenerative anemias are not macrocytic and hypochromic, and they don't necessarily have a high uh, RDW. So please look at that blood smear, all right? You guys are okay with that? Okay. So I'm gonna show you another dog uh, that is, uh, anybody here has a laser sight? All right, so I'm going to show you a laser sight case. So I put in a few different things so everybody's happy. So perhaps the biggest clinical question in this case will be why would somebody name a male dog Nadia? That could be perhaps the most important question, but we don't know that, all right? So Nadia comes to the clinic exactly the same way that Toby, all right? And this is an owner that takes the dog in for frequent evaluations at the vet. The dog is a terrier mix, one of these bouncy little dogs, and the owner brings uh, Nadia in and he says, you know, he has not eaten at all today, and my dog has never not eaten, so I'm really, really worried about him, and I want for you to do some additional diagnostics. So he has mild splenomegaly, he's slightly depressed, uh, so he looks just like Toby, minus the pale mucous membranes, right? So he does not have pale mucous membranes. So I'm going to show you, ignore this, the only reason I'm showing you this whole list is to show you that the leukogram looks fine, okay? I don't want for you to look at the numbers, I'm, I'm going to magnify the numbers I want for you to look at. So I'm going to ask you this, is Nadia anemic? Nope, all right, so it's a hematocrit of 50.2. What do you think, is this a, an appropriate number of reticulocytes for a dog that is not anemic or not? No, right, and all those are reticulocytes. So, so we have a dog that doesn't feel well since yesterday or since this morning, that has a normal hematocrit and that has a high number of reticulocytes and he doesn't feel well, all right? So I'm gonna ask you this, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna give him Rimadil and see me in the morning? You wanna look at a blood smear? I know you don't look at blood smears, you haven't already told me that numerous times and I'm trying to convince you that perhaps that's a good idea. Abdominal ultrasound, thoracic radiographs, you guys want to look at the smear, correct? All right, remember, any time you have regeneration, the smear is quite likely to help you determine the mechanism of the anemia because morphologic red cell changes are associated with the type of hemolysis, all right? Okay, so the first thing that you see is that even though he had a total white count of 4.5 and a normal diff that I didn't show you, he is left shifted, all right? So those, those two are bands, all right? That's likely a band, and those are angry monocytes, okay? So remember, when we see bands, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, to me, as a clinician, bands are the best markers of systemic inflammation, period, all right? Even if we run C-reactive protein, give me bands or toxic cells any day. What do you think that is? It's not a lymphocyte. It's something with a nucleus, a nucleated something. Red cell, all right, so that's a metal rubber site, okay? And I ask you this, does he have reticulous eyes? Sure, because he has polychromation. There's a nuclear red. What is that? What is that? What is that? All right, so what happens So we have a dog that has a normal hematocrit with a lot of reticulous eyes and spherocytes, okay? Could you have a dog that is hemolyzing but has not yet become anemic? What do you think? Absolutely, all right? So the discussion they have with the owners is that this is early immune-mediated hemolysis and it's compensated, and the owner was all in. She said, we're coming back tomorrow morning with my husband. We're gonna start him on Pred and Azathioprine, and that evening he came back in with a hematocrit of 28, all right? So about nine hours after they saw him in the morning, he hemolyzed. So the reason I'm telling you this is because we now recognize that we see a subset of dogs that have a normal to slightly increased hematocrit and reticulocytes, and we used to ignore them, all right? Now, a lot of them are 
angry little dogs, all right? So if you have a chihuahua that is trying to bite you, if you have a white runner that is jumping up and down or a springer that is running in every direction, uh, we did a really nice, elegant study in a Greyhound racetrack and we showed that catecholamine release and splenic contraction increases the number of reticulocytes for minutes, all right? So if you have a pissed off little dog that is trying to attack you, those guys are expected to have high reticulocyte numbers, all right? And Andreas Moritz, that is a colleague of mine in Gießen in Germany, he has a colony of laboratory beagles. So, so have you guys ever worked with lab beagles? Are they quiet, sedated dogs? No, they're nuts, all right? So what did he do? He trained them to be even more nuts. So he actually brings this golden retriever that gets them all excited, and they start jumping up and down like this. So he puts central lines, and he has the pre-golden and the post-golden, all right? And they go up to 350,000 reticulocytes, okay? So when they get excited and they have catecholamine release, boom, they shoot up and they go all the way up. But for you as clinicians, this is the big thing, you guys. We see so many immune-mediated hemolytic anemias and hemangios that come to you, your primary care clinicians. So they come to you with, my dog doesn't feel well since yesterday, all right? and you see this reticulocytes with a normal hematocrit, always look at the smear. You will be amazed at how many dogs you'll find fragments and acanthocytes in and thrombocytopenia or spherocytes. So you, I can show you, I have a collection of dozens of these cases because we see them in primary care practice all the time. So, so this is another one of the take-home points. If you see, what would happen if you run a CVC in an impedance counter in this dog? It would be normal. All right? And because the values are normal, you would not have looked at the blood smear. So you would have diagnosed this dog when they are clinically ill. Does that make sense, you guys? All right, good. So I'm gonna finish up with white cells. I'm gonna show you a couple of cases, actually three cases, I think. So the only thing I wanna show you here is this, that we mentioned in passing when I talked about bouncers. So if you have a sick dog or cat, a sick dog or cat should have a stress recovery. And a stress leukogram's most consistent change is lymphopenia. So my motto is a dog with a stress leukogram should not have a high lymphocyte count, right? I'm gonna show you a couple of things in a minute. Do you guys know, if I were to ask you, so let's say you're talking to a client, uh, their dog is not feeling well, and you are looking at the results of the CVC, and the dog has an 8.2 total white count, right? 8,000 white count. Do you feel comfortable telling that owner because the white count is normal, your dog does not have severe inflammation? Or can you have severe inflammation associated with a normal total white count? What do you guys think? If I'm asking you, why do you think that is? What do they teach us in vet school? If you have inflammation, you have a high white count, right? And forget about that because I want to show you this graphic, all right? This is a study looking at a lot of cats, all right? The same thing happens in dogs. but. What I want for you to pay attention to is this. So this is toxicity, all right? So 50%, 49.5% of cats with severe inflammation that we classified as such based on the toxicity of the leukocytes had a normal neutrophil count and normal total white count, all right? So the, the important message is you cannot exclude severe systemic inflammation in a patient with a normal total white count or neutrophil count. Really important, particularly if you're using an impedance counter. And I'm gonna show you why with a case, with a tragic case. Okay, do you guys remember, so the neutrophils live, so remember from the time you have a, a pluripotential stem cell until a neutrophil comes out of a bone marrow, it's about five to seven days, all right? So that's the transit time from blast to neutrophil. Do you guys remember whether a neutrophil circulates in the blood for six to eight minutes, hours, days, or weeks? How many of you for minutes? Hours, right? How many of you for days? I'm counting hands. How many of you for weeks? Decades, you want to put decades? <laughs> centuries, <laughs> six to eight centuries? Roman neutrophils, all right? The correct answer is hours, right? Six to eight hours. So remember, this is a normal dog, and as I usually tell people, think about a cat with a pyothorax. Think about a dog with a pyometra. Think about a cat with a bivalent abscess. Neutrophils may be in the blood for minutes, all right? And I'm sure you guys have all heard the song that is called Jerry the Neutrophil, written by my son, who is a fourth year veterinary student. And it says, and I don't think I'm coming home because neutrophils were born to roam and explode at opportune times, all right? So 
I happen to have two kids who are 28, well, will be 28 next month, and one is a second year oncology resident at UC Davis, and the second one is a fourth year veterinary student at Ohio State, and guess what? He kind of likes oncology, so it must be some sort of a genetic mutation uh, that has affected the two of them. So, so the deal is, I'm telling you this because to me, this is the biggest pitch for why you should be doing in-house hematology. Because if you have a dog that is critically ill, by the time the CVC comes back from the lab, I can guarantee you that leucogram is different. I'm gonna show you sequential CVCs here in a minute. So if you see toxic changes or left shifts, that's not good, isn't it? So you worry if you have a patient that has toxic changes or a left shift, and you should because dogs with toxic neutrophil changes are twice as likely to die as dogs that have equivalent total white counts without toxic neutrophils, and cats with severe left shifts. Look at this mortality. Almost two out of three of these cats are gonna die, all right? So, so why do I work with IDEX? This is Carl Gendry's group. Uh, Carl was actually one of my students at OSU, and he's at Davis, so there's a lot of ex-Davis signs here that are smiling. And so here's the story, all right? So I worked with IDEX for a long time, and one of their engineers that was the guy that primarily was involved in designing the software for the laser side and is involved with the pro side is always asking for input, all right? And we became really good friends. This is Jim Russell. And in talking with Jim a few years ago, he was going, well, what would you want out of this instrument? And we said, well, I would like to find cancer cells. I would like to find left shift and toxic changes. So I'm gonna show you what they have done. So this is Scout, that is a seven-year-old female spade papillon that we saw in a clinic in central Ohio and had a ruptured cruciate and patellar luxation, uh, had a normal CVC, a normal profile, had surgery on June 2nd, so this is just a few weeks ago, and had just transient hypoglycemia, asymptomatic, uh, after the surgery, went home on tramadol and a non -steroidal. everything is fine, all right? Except that she's like a little boomerang because she came back 10 days later with anorexia, depression, and fever. And she has a little bit of a temperature, she has inspiratory dyspnea, and she has crackles on the right side, okay? So we're thinking she likely has aspiration pneumonia, and we take thoracic radiographs, and most of you will likely agree that she has a consolidated right middle lung lobe with her bronchogram, so, so she likely does have aspiration pneumonia. So she doesn't look really all that bad, right? So she, she looks sort of stable, it's a little puny, and, and she's a patient at the clinic since she's a pup. So she's a spunky little dog, and we can tell she's not feeling well. So I'm gonna show you uh, the CVC in a second, but first I want to remind you of something. So you've seen this graph before, and I told you those are the neutrophils, those are the eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, monocytes. Fluorescence increases as you go up, correct? So I'm going to ask you this. So if a dog has toxic changes or a left shift, all right? So remember, what, what is a left shift or toxic changes? You are skipping mitosis in the bone marrow. So you're releasing them before the cells are fully cooked, all right? So the toxic neutrophils are called toxic because they have blue stuff in the cytoplasm, okay? Including dollar bodies, okay? So that blue stuff is RNA, correct? So what do you think? Will a toxic neutrophil, or a band, glow more or less than a neutrophil? More, all right? And they will live right there, okay? So here's what happens. The instrument is gonna run this sample, all right? And I'm gonna show you what happens here in a minute. And it's gonna encounter this dude or dudette, whatever it may be. And it will say, I'll be darned. You know, it kinda looks like a neutrophil, but it glows like a lymphocyte or it glows so much that it glows like a monocyte, okay? But I am not sure if it's a lymphocyte or a monocyte, okay? So how is it going to communicate that to us? I'm gonna show you here in a second. So let me show you this graphic. So this is a normal dog, and this is Scout, okay? Do they look the same? No. What do you think is missing here? She has no neutrophils, all right? You guys see there's like three or four little dots in there, so she has no neutrophils. So what's happening is, you guys see this whole population, I'm gonna show you this better slide. So there are no neutrophils in there, right? That whole ellipse that you see there are going to be toxic neutrophils or bands, okay? So you guys remember, when you have a bad left shift, what comes before band? Metamylocytes, all right? So I'm gonna show you the metamylocyte and pay attention to those little dots up there at the top because I'm gonna go back to them 
in a second. That's a metamyelocyte, right? So that's a toxic metamyelocyte. So it has a big nucleus that is really blue and a lot of RNA in the cytoplasm. So they glow a lot and they are at the very top of that monocyte cloud, all right? So I'm gonna go back here. So the instrument will do two things to catch our attention, all right? And with the new software, it will tell you bands suspected. First, you see that there is a straight line in between the two populations as opposed to being separate clouds, all right? So this is actually the instrument telling you, you know what, I'm having a little difficulty with this cell. So I know you don't do this for a living, I know you do not use the microscope, but could you please look at the blood smear to see if I am really a toxic cell or a band, all right? And the other thing that it's going to do is, you see he has a total white count of 21.6, that is high, 0 0.3 neutrophils, there were no purple dots, so she's severely neutropenic. Suspect bands, all right, so we think there is a left shift. So what do you think? She has too many lymphocytes. Remember we said a sick dog should not have very many lymphocytes because they should have a stress leukogram. But do you notice that next to the neutrophils, to the lymphocytes, and to the monocytes, there is a little asterisk? That's the second way the instrument is telling you, I don't think they're actually lymphocytes. They kind of look like lymphocytes, but I am fairly sure they are not, so please look at this mirror. All right, does that make sense, you guys? It also gives you this little message in there that is conveniently placed where your left thumb will hold that sheet of paper, all right? So it will be right there and you will not pay attention to it. So, so that thrombocytopenia is likely because she's bacteremic or she's septic. So, so again, don't pay attention to the number of lymphocytes because those are not lymphocytes, all right? And sometimes people get hung up on Oh, the prostate is giving me too many lymphocytes. Well, no, they're not lymphocytes because he's telling you I think they're bands, right? So if you ask me what is the best feature of the prostate in terms of day-to-day -day patient management in the clinic and the one that has saved the most patients from bad stuff is this for me, the ability to detect bands and toxic cells. So this software was developed at IDEX, first in the horse and now for the dog and the cat and other species. And it works so well that Sysmex, their partner company for the ProSide, is now using that software for humans, left shift, and toxic changes. So this is a great feature of the machine. And just to show you what happens with sequential CBCs, three, four days go by, there's still nothing going on, but now on day five, you can see that there are some neutrophils appearing. Uh, I'm not gonna show you the chest films, but she's looking a little bit better. So how good is this thing? So this is Blizzard. This is a seven-year-old uh, Springer that had a penetrating chest wound and pyothorax. So we actually did a thoracotomy, stripped the pleura, removed the foreign body, and this is actually day two, okay? So I want for you to see the sequential uh, leukogram. So you see how he's really left shifted, a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less, and now he's kind of looking normal, all right? So Dr. Dini Kola, who some of you have met, Dennis, uh, there are two people in the world that are the best pathologists to look at a blood smear. Dennis and Al Rivard. Those are the two best guys, at least in my humble opinion. If you have a really weird blood smear, you want for one of these two guys to look at it. So here's what Dennis did. He, he actually was instrumental in helping develop the prosite, but he said, even though this is a really, really nice instrument, it's not gonna be as good as I am. I can actually, match the blood smear with the graphics, all right? And guess what happened? He did 400 cell differentials and he could not, actually. So he could only find toxic neutrophils on that day. The instrument kept finding them on subsequent days, even though the blood smears look normal. And that is, again, because the instrument is counting almost 18,000 cells and we're counting on a good day, 400. Make sense, you guys? So the message is, when you see those asterisks, please, please, please pay attention to them, all right? And what I, came, what I came to realize is that when the prosite flags something, you better look at that smear because the instrument is really, really good at it. This, uh, actually there is a colleague who speaks Spanish and he will appreciate the, this, uh, the fun part of this. So I'm in the Netherlands and we're doing a lab with a bunch of veterinarians and they brought CVCs and blood smears for us to look at. So they give me the CVC on this five month old uh, kitty that is really, really sick. And I look at the CVC and you know, the cat's name is Guantes. And I tell the veterinarian, I say, well, the first thing I can tell you is that this is a black cat with white paws. And she looks at me and she goes, how can you tell that from the CVC? I go, no, because this means mittens in Spanish, right? So 
So one test means mittens. So, so this is a really sick kitty, okay? So this cat is hyperthermic, and now she's getting hypo, hypo, he is getting hypothermic. So she brings the printout from their impedance counter, okay? So I photograph her with my phone. So, so are you guys worried about a total white count of 8.2? Is it ringing any bells? Or you, do you have any alarms going on in your head? You know, you have a sick kitty, but the total white count is normal, and the total neutrophil count is normal, correct? So it's not really bothering you at all. So I didn't show you uh, leukocyte histograms from an impedance counter, but that's the way they should look, and they look about the same. The only issue is the instrument didn't cut them where they should. So, so you guys remember, when you look at a blood smear, the monocytes are really big, okay? But when they're floating in the blood, they are smaller than a neutrophil, because in the glass, they really stick and they spread in every direction, all right? So in a histogram for leukocytes, those are limbs, the valley are the monocytes, and the second hump are the neutrophils, right? So normal values with normal graphics, right? So you look at that and your conclusion is, I'm not worried about the leukogram in this cat. But let me show you the blood smear. This cat does not have one normal neutrophil, all right? So it's severely left-shifted, so even metamylocytes. So, so this cat is really in deep trouble, all right? So I tell this veterinarian, this cat is really in trouble. Uh, find out how the cat is doing. The cat is already dead, all right? So two hours after the cat was admitted, uh, he died. And the vet just sent me the necropsy. This cat had actually, for the internal, it's kind of interesting, an E. coli uh, osteomyelitis in the left femur with bacteremia. Really, really weird stuff. But, but again, you look at the results in an impedance counter, and you blew it off. You said, there's nothing that worries me here, all right? Make sense? And, uh, for those of you who have a laser sight, uh, the question came up yesterday, can I use the laser sight to see if there is severe inflammation? This is George, that is a sick febrile cat. Uh, this is just to show you how platelet clumps show up in the, in the laser sight. And notice, so the clouds are different, but the colors mean the same thing, all right? So the red are the monocytes, and the purple or lavender are the neutrophils. And you see how there is a straight line between the monocytes and the neutrophils? and you see how this cloud is a lot more upright. So even though I don't know that this has been validated, this is my experience. So when I see a patient that has really inflammatory leukograms, you get this upright neutrophil cloud, and you have that straight cut in between the monos and the, and the neutrophils. So I'm gonna finish with uh, Rosie, because this is a really cool case. This is a case that Dennis uh, Nicola consulted on, Dog that doesn't feel well, and the numerical values of the CDC are pretty boring, all right? So Dennis had actually done a slide review before he looked at dog plots, and he did not find any abnormalities in the slide review. So I'm gonna show you a normal dog and rosy. So you guys see all these purple dots up there? So those are platelet clumps, all right? So uh, you notice that those EOs do not live where they should, okay, so they are a little bit higher. All these are platelet clumps. So what that means is that the platelets are aggregated and are being counted as white cells, so your differential will not be accurate because it's gonna tell you they have a lot of eosinophils, but they are not eos, they are platelet clumps. Make sense? All right? But here's what I want for you to pay attention to. You guys see those? I think we counted 21 dots up there, 22 dots with that is. And you look at that and you go, eh, all right? But we've done, I've, I've looked at 22, 23, 24,000 CDCs with the ProSide, so I learned that when I see a lot of cells in there, I better pay attention, okay? So Dennis went back and he had three blood smears from this dog. Nothing on the first blood smear. Second blood smear, he found these four cells in the feather edge. And in the third blood smear, he found these three cells that you can easily see, that's a plasma cell, all right? These are plasma cells. Long story short, this dog had myeloma. It was, so these cells were in circulation, and I have to tell you that how did I start with this? I would see all these dots in there and not find any abnormal cells in this mirror. And I said, I don't know what the hell these dots are. So then what I started doing is when I found these dots up there, I started doing bone marrow aspirates in these dogs. And I started finding those with, for example, acute myeloid leukemia that have a normal leukogram and just 20 little dots up there, and I find them in the bone marrow. So again, because you're looking at 18,000 cells as opposed to the few that you can catch in a blood smear. So this is a Spanish dog from Mallorca, two-year-old mixed breed dog. This is uh, uh, this little dude by the name of Lolly. 
An ADR, remember, means ain't doing right, okay? So in the States, when a dog doesn't feel well, it's ADR. So his bail has petechia, myelinfadenopathy, and splenomegaly. And Lucia is a friend of mine. She's an Italian vet that practices in Mallorca. So I ask you this. Does he, uh, is he anemic? All right, so he has severe anemia. And I ask you, is the anemia regenerative? What do you think? Yes, all right, half a million red ticks, okay? So, so one in every four red cells is a red tick. So it's a strongly regenerative anemia. So we said if it's a strongly regenerative anemia, it has to be hemolysis, all right? Pretty easy. But we didn't look at the dot plots, did we? Okay, let me show you the dot plots. This is Lolly. So this is Josie, who you met before. What is different in these two dot plots? What do you think about this? Do they spread all the way from the young ones to the old ones, or do they all live in the same postal code? They all live in the same apartment building, all right? And you're going, huh? That's kind of funny. It's almost like an egg, all right, just sitting in there. So again, remember, it goes back to the way these instruments work. So they do a red cell run first, okay? And the instrument is trained to say, if I am doing a red cell run and I see something big and round that glows, I'm going to call it a reticulocyte, okay? Because there are never those many white cells, so I have to call it a reticulocyte. Does that make sense, you guys? Okay, so what do you think about this white cell dot plot? Are those good cells or bad cells? Bad cells, all right, because they, they widen towards the top. That's what we call a tornado cloud, and that's your typical acute leukemia dot plot. So you can diagnose acute leukemia from looking at that thing from the parking lot, all right? Very, very easy. So. I'm going to show you, that's what we call the tornado cloud, as I was telling you. What do you think about the white count? So the highest number that the prosite will output is 997.5, all right? So this is the blood smear, all right? So, so basically there's probably 2 million red cells or, or white cells per microliter. So when these white cells are being counted in the red cell run, the only thing they could be for the instrument is retakes, but they are not retakes because they live in that very small area. So, so when we started fiddling with this, this was another one of the issues I brought up to Jim, and I go, Jim, can you exclude them or flag them if they all live in the same area, all right? Your next version of the software will have that. You know, we'll rerun a bunch of cases through it, and it's really, really good. I mean, you're not gonna think that in 994,000 counties, a bad infection. Are you, you know, you're going to say that's really evil stuff, so you're not going to believe the, the, neutroph or the, the retics. But I want to show you, first you think they are neutrophils, but I'm going to show you, that looks like a little snowman. You see that? And I want to show you these other guys up close. Okay, look at this. All right? All right, so these are neoplastic T cells. This is a T cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or T cell ALL. So, so the point here is all this, if you have a really high Y count, they will be counted as retakes, but they will all live in the same area. This is a 10-year-old golden, healthy, asymptomatic, comes in for a senior checkup to a clinic I work at in Columbus, and she has a 627,000 Y count, all right? And you guys can see those are not retakes because they all live in the same area. But you see the difference in this tracing? The instrument recognizes them as lymphocytes. Okay, they are not up here with all the wild cells with the big nuclei and the blue cytoplasm because they are lymphocytes. So this is a chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So CLL is very, very easy to diagnose. You pick it out of the lineup very, very easily. And just to show you, you know, Matt was talking to you about uh, Vet Connect Plus. It saves me conservatively three to four hours a week when I do consoles because I used to get 25 pages in a fax with all the CVCs and profiles and they had to call Aiden, they were upside down, so now I just go look at this, click, trend, boom, 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 and you know that you can share this with colleagues. When I get consoles now, they share the page with me so I can just directly look at the Vet Connect Plus and it's really, really awesome. So I'm gonna finish up and you know, hematology is a bit more art than uh, chemistry. Chemistry is more science and I remember in hematology, normal is not necessarily normal. In chemistry, usually normal is normal. But uh, I know you're not gonna look at blood smears, but if you could, all right, uh, I would ask you to look at smears if you have abnormal numbers, if you have abnormal graphics, if you have retics, because that's gonna help you with the mechanism, 
or if you have normal values with a really, really sick patient. And, and again, in case you didn't write down the email address, uh, you have it right there again. So with that, you guys, uh, questions, comments, thoughts, uh, I went over by about three minutes, but hopefully that's, uh, that's all right. Most of you stayed away, which is really good. I'm very proud of you. Questions? Yes. Uh, I may have missed it, but where, where do the nuclear red cells? Oh, really? Well, I tell you, I can, uh, let me pull one with nuclear red cells to show you. But the nuclear red cells actually live behind the neutrophils. So I can, I have a dog with nuclear red cells. So those little dudes in there, you guys see that little circle in there behind the neutrophils? You see those orange dots? Those are nuclear red cells. And those little blue dots are nuclear red cells. So now you're also getting a nuclear red cell flag if they are more than X per microliter. We, we always have to negotiate how sensitive do you want for the instrument to be, because remember, if it's really sensitive, it's going to flag a lot of things. And for the bands, you guys, you can see a really nice inflammatory look around there with bands or toxic changes. It has an 85% sensitivity and a 95% specificity. So when you see it, it's the real deal. So it works very, very well. So sorry, it, it, it's all three colors there at the back. Yeah, so here you have, the instrument is not sure if they are neutrophils or limbs, or limbs or motors. So all, this is all a nice inflammatory liquor. And those are probably metamylocytes or extremely toxic neutrophils. So I remember, if you have a lot of dotted bodies, those things glow, so they will move all the way up to the top floor. Anything else? You guys are wasted, aren't you? Class dismissed then. Thank you guys. Appreciate it.